memory series. Um, I will tell you that our next one is going to be on April 3rd, uh, Tuesday at 1 o'clock, same time, same place. And we have our retired um, chief of the fire department, Philip Bourne, coming. So, yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, that should be a fun one. I hope you all will be able to be here. Um, and as you know, we are filming this um, with the help of the Manchester Historical Society, who will preserve these interviews and talks for other generations, which is a really nice, nice addition, I think, to the all the history that they are preserving. So today, we have Gail Rice, who I'm sure many of you were here know. She was for many years. Uh, if I'm correct, from 1982 to 2001. That's when I was director, yes. You were director <laughs> of the Mark Skinner Library, and before that she was an assistant librarian at Burnburg. At Burnburg, and then three years assistant at Mark Skinner before I became before the director. Yes. Very impressive. I have heard she's a great storyteller, <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Gail. I'm quite overwhelmed to see so many of you here, so I'm going to try not to fall on my face. <laughs> I came to Manchester in 1958. Carl and I had just graduated from Castleton Teachers College. He had taught for half a year while he did his senior year. That was included. I had done student teaching, but that was our first job in a, in a school, per se, a year-long job. And, of course, we were at Manchester Elementary School, no middle. And we were looking for a place to live here. And it was, um, it was kind of difficult because teachers were not overly paid, to put it mildly. I think I made uh, $2,200 the first year I taught. And Carl, being a man, made $35. <laughs> uh, the glass ceiling was very, very heavy. However, we found a place. We found a place right on the green. It was a lovely three-room apartment with a humongous bathroom with a beautiful window right in front of the toilet where you could sit and look at the valley below and be comfortable and calm. It was very tranquil. And it belonged to Eleanor Thompson. Now, Eleanor Thompson worked for the telephone company, and at that time, the telephone company her part was across the road where Dr. Madcore had his dental office. That was before that. So all she had to do was get up in the morning and dress and whiz across the street and go to work and whiz back. And she had this apartment, and she hadn't rented it before, so she had just redone it. And we rented it, and we rented it for $60 a month, each a heart out. And the lovely part of it was, it was right there on the green. I believe there is a business in there now. Uh, it was um, Martin Harding and Mazzotti, but they've moved, so it's, I think it's insurance or something. Brother Chamber. Yeah. Is it? Oh, yeah. And there was just one house between her place and the fire station, the old fire station, which is now a wine shop. So we didn't miss out on anything. And the first time that fire alarm went off at 2 o'clock in the morning, we levitated off that bed. And he swore that I ran around the bed three times saying, what is it, what is it, what is it? But we got very used to it. We didn't turn a hair when it went off, whatever. But we always knew, because at that time, they had a blackboard in the firehouse where they wrote where the fire was. Those were lovely days. And we could sneak over and take a look and say, oh, maybe we better go, you know. We always knew where the fire was. We always knew when there was any excitement because the pickup trucks would come roaring in and Carl would go down and say, what's up? And they would say, well, the twins are lost in the woods and we're out for the search party and the twins being what they were and I knew them. Uh, second grade, I said, well, so I strolled over and I said, the twins are lost. Oh yeah, the twins are lost in the woods. And you know there's bears up there. I said, I pity any bear that eats those bears. <laughs> it's going to have indigestion for the next hundred years. Well, they searched all night. No toys. In the morning, they gathered for coffee and get their strength back so they could 
go back and look. The father of the twins helped with the search. Long about the time they were ready to head into the woods, out of the woods come the twins, strolling along like it was just any old day. And they said to them, where have you been? In the woods. Well, didn't you hear us crying and screaming and, you know. Well, we heard the noise, so we got scared and we climbed a tree. So the two little devils were sitting up in a tree while all this went on. <laughs> didn't come down till summer, till morning. The funny part of the whole thing was, the father built the town for the time he spent searching in the woods for his twins. And at first, everybody got kind of mad about it. And then the humor of the whole situation <laughs> hit people. Needless to say, he didn't get paid, but it created a lot of laughter and turned a sour situation into something funny. That was one thing. Eleanor was a character, if there ever was one. She was wonderful. She was the hardest working person, not woman, person I have ever laid eyes on. She married Harold Thompson. She was from uh, Canada. She was French-Canadian. She married Harold. He was born with half his arm missing. His parents owned the house on Cemetery Road, where Kathleen James lives now, where we live for 18 years. And they had a farm. And the big barn that's up near Happy Days Preschool was their barn. And the field was open then, and that's where they pastured their cows, brought them in at night, and there was a barn at the end of our property, or their property, and that's where they spent the night. The L on the house was a dairy. And Eleanor milked, Eleanor hayed, Eleanor delivered milk, Eleanor worked like a dog. Harold died of cancer, fairly young, which left her with two young kids. And Junie Thompson, her mother-in-law, I guess, was a very difficult woman, and I'm putting it nicely. So she moved uh, the kids to her aunt's house, which was the house on the green that we had the apartment in. So she lived below us, and we lived above. And that woman could swear. I mean, she made a pirate seem like nothing. Every other word, she'd blast off. But she had a heart of gold. She would do anything for you. She was lovely to us. She was a good, good person. Her best friend was Teresa Zulo, who taught eighth grade at the school. And my husband taught the other eighth grade. They were great pals. Teresa was a big woman. She had a lot of trouble with her feet and her legs. She had the most beautiful face you can imagine with long eyelashes. And in the morning, Carl would go in with a cup of coffee for her. And they would talk and she would say, Carl, dear, do you suppose you could take my eyes fluttering? Do you suppose you could take my noon duty today? And he'd say, of course, Teresa. So he ended up doing her new duty as well as his own, but he didn't care. Everybody loved Teresa. She was a terrific teacher. And she was Eleanor's best friend. We all still quote her. Yes. Yeah. One day, Teresa told me, howling with laughter, she said, I was across the street having coffee with Eleanor. And her son, Junior, Sonny, came in, and something had gone wrong. And he was furious, and he swore, oh, he swore something fierce. And Eleanor rose up out of her chair, and she said, You shut your mouth. We will not have that kind of talk in this house. I don't ever want to hear you swear like that again. Say you're sorry. I'm sorry. And he left. And Teresa said to her, Eleanor, you swear every other word. <laughs> How can you possibly tell him he can't swear? And Eleanor said, in my house, you do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> and that's the way it was. But every time I got sick, and of course it was my first year teaching, and I caught every germ that went by, because I had no resistance built up, she would be up the stairs. With, she was a great believer that port wine would cure everything. And in those days, I did not drink. And I had a bad indigestion problem. And she came up the stairs and said, what is the matter? I have heard that toilet flush about 400 times. And I said, I'm horribly sick. I've been throwing up. I'm really sick. Not to worry, she said. I've got the cure. I said, what kind of a cure is that? I'll bring it up. So she brought a small water glass full of port wine. 
And I said, well, thank you, thinking she'll leave I'll pour it. <laughs> I'm standing here till you drink it. Oh. Well, I drank it, and I will tell you, in 25 minutes, I was cured. It worked. <laughs> when Carl got home, I was up getting his supper. If anyone had mentioned food, the whole 24 hours, I would have died. And everything was fine. So I swear by, you've got an indigestion problem, you pick up a stomach bug, take port wine, it'll cure you. That's amazing. We all, there were also other characters, and I love people, and I love characters. And we had four or five sort of elderly men, I don't mean old, I mean late middle years around town who loved to imbibe and frequently were seen staggering about the streets, uh, occasionally picked up by the police. And one of them, his name was Furt Lake. And anybody who's been around any time knows the name. And Furt had a pretty good future. He was a terrific baseball player. And I understand from what I was told that he really could have had a career, maybe with a minor team, but he could have. But he took to drink at an early age, and he much preferred it to anything else. And uh, he had a habit of just showing up at Eleanor's back door and saying, I'm coming down off a drunk, Eleanor, and I need to work today. I need to sweat it off. Can I mow your lawn? Yes, and he'd be out there mowing away to beat the band, and she'd take him glasses of iced tea and water to wash out his system. So they were pals. Well, Ferb had a habit of hanging out on the bench in front of Purdy's shoe store, and that's where the bus came in. That was where you bought your bus ticket, was at Purdy's. And he'd sit out there, and particularly in the summer, and he was apt to make a few comments at the people who got off the bus and passed in front of him. And I, he was totally harmless. He was a gentleman, really, except when he was in his cups. So one day I drove in, and the Grand Union was right next to Purdy's shoe store at that time. And when I drove in, the bus came in right behind me. And I pulled in, and I sat there. And there was Ferb sitting on the bench. And a very nice-looking middle-aged woman got off the bus and walked in front of him to go into the shoe store. And I saw his mouth move, but I couldn't hear what he was saying. Well, you could tell by the way she flounced in the door. She was not a happy camper. A few minutes later, up drove a police car with two policemen in it. And I thought, this is going to be fun. I'm watching this. So I sat there with the windows down, and they were so nice. They got out, and instead of taking him and thrusting him into the back seat and driving off, I heard them say, because my ears were flapping then, <laughs> Fur, it's a hot day, you look hot, let's take you home. I don't care to, he said. Don't want to go home. Instead, as I said, of you know, manhandling him into the car, because obviously a complaint had been reported, they talked with him for about 10 minutes, and pretty soon he got in the back seat and off they trundled. And I thought, you know, what a nice way to handle that. Well, it turned out, because as soon as a nice looking woman left, I trundled into Purdy's shoe store and said, what the hey? And they said she walked, they got laughing and said, she walked by Ferb and he said, hey lady, nice looking legs. And she took great affront at that. I would have said thank you, sir, and headed right in there. You know, you don't get that handed to you very often. But uh, she didn't like it, so he had to go home. There was a flood the next spring, and it came over the plectron. We need two cops to go down to Lybrook Road because the water's rising and Ferb's laid out drunk on his cot and he's going to drown. <laughs> Another time in the middle of the winter they retrieved him. He was over at the fairgrounds, conked out over there. And they hauled him home. Yeah, the grandstand. So there was another character and there were three or four more that were mm, on a... They weren't as gentlemanly as fur, but they were sort of out of farm. And one hot day, one of them, who in the summer wore overhauls and rubber boots that came up with the tops turned down, no shirt, went up by the park where there was the little place, the little building where two lovely ladies handed out pamphlets and directions and what have you. And he got right in front of it and the strap broke on his overhauls, and down they went, because they were held up with one strap, and it seemed that Ferb had forgotten his underwear that day. <laughs> <laughs> and the 
plucking and the squawking from that place was on a par with somebody throwing a rock in a hen house. It was pretty wild. And out of the brick building that was the news guy for many years came George, and I cannot think of his last Robert. name. Robert. And he took hold of this gentleman and hauled him in and pinned up his overhauls. And he came back out with his two bags and went off up the street. But I understand it took the women quite some time to calm down after that one. And unfortunately, I was not in my kitchen window when that happened because I would have had the whole scene right before my eyes, but I missed it and it really disappointed me. Okay. There were a lot of top characters and two of them were taxi drivers. One was Nola Nole, who was shaped like a short barrel. And her mouth was almost on a par with Eleanor Thompson's, but Eleanor was a little more crafty. And the other was Mrs. Elliot. And I never heard her first name. I always thought it was Mrs. Florence. 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 And she was a big lady. And I'm no oil painting by any means, but I will tell you, she was not what you would call beautiful. And of course, they were in competition with each other, and sometimes it got a little hot. And Nola was a character under her own right, I mean, on her own, never mind Mrs. Elliot. And when my son worked for Briggs Fowler Insurance, started working there, they were in the office on Bonnet Street, and he handled Nola's insurance. And she'd call him up, Seth, Nola, yes, Nola, what can I do for you today? I'm bringing my check. I'll be driving in in a few minutes. A few minutes, she'd come in the driveway, whirl around, come down, blow her horn, and he went out and got her check. As far as I know, rain, snow, whatever the weather, Nola never went in that place. Seth would trot out. So she thought quite highly of him. <laughs> she really did. Well, one night, they were down at the Taco House, which was the local den of iniquity at that time. There was a lot of excitement there. And they were in there, getting their evening little drink. And they got fighting. So they were invited to take it out on the sidewalk, which they did. And it evolved into something quite physical. There was shoving and pushing and swearing and cursing and yelling and screaming. And the police were called and up drove Gene Gianni. And Gene got out and tried to calm them down and couldn't. So he got between them because by then it was fisticuffs. So they knocked him down and broke his wrist. <laughs> and he was brother-in-law to Lois Squires, and she and Phil lived just down around the corner from us on Cemetery Road. And we were invited to their parties and so forth and had a wonderful time. I had the greatest time with Gene. I said, Gene, I'm so disappointed in you. I always thought if I was in trouble, I could call, and you would come and stand between me and whatever mayhem was going on and now two old ladies knocked you down for a car. I no longer have that confidence that I had before. And he'd laugh, you know, and say, well, broken arm or no broken arm, I can protect you. <laughs> that makes me feel real good. Now, how much further can we go here? Because I don't want to run over time and bore you all to death. I loved this town when I moved here because it was a town a little town, sort of a sleepy town. Even the village wasn't quite up to snuff because the Equinox house was on its way down at the time. Things were slow, but I could go down Main Street after I'd lived here a few months. I would know everybody that worked in the stores. I knew Factory Point Bank, which was the only bank in town, which made banking very simple. And I could talk with them and have a wonderful time. Now you walk down there and nobody knows you, really, very few. I would go into the Grand Union, the checkout ladies, and I would have a lovely conversation while they were checking me out. And if we met on the street, we always stopped and talked. And it was such a nice feeling. The parents of my students were lovely, interesting people, with the exception of Mr. Comar. Oh. <laughs> Now, this isn't about you. This is about your older brother, Michael, oh. <laughs> whom I had the second year I taught fourth grade. Yeah. And Michael was a nice kid. He never gave me a bit of trouble. And that spring, we were going to have a Valentine's Day party. They were all 
on site. And Michael came up to me the day before and he said, Mrs. Rice, can I bring my sister Nancy? I said, sure, of course you can bring Nancy. Well, she's awful little. I said, that's okay, if she wants to come, you bring her. So the next day he came in with Nancy, who was little is right, curly hair and snappy dark eyes. And he took her over to a chair and he had to boost her up, put her on the chair and she sat there grinning at everybody. And he said to me, this is Rice, don't touch her, she bites. <laughs> <laughs> it's a perfectly straight face. I bet you, Bibby, I won't touch her. <laughs> well, I've never known her to bite, but she bite a bit in Michael. Probably. <laughs> And another one I could talk about is Leroy Hayes, oh, yeah. whom I had the same year, fourth grade. And he was bigger than I was at the time. I think at the time I weighed 102 pounds. And he had a very bad habit, but the trouble is it always made me laugh. When I was lining the kids up to go in or out for recess or whatever, he'd come up behind me and he'd pick me up. <laughs> and he could do it. He was a strapping kid. He was taller than I was. And he'd say, now what you going to do, teacher? And I'd say, I'm going to pound you on top of your head if you don't put me down this very instant. And the first couple weeks that I was teaching, we, he and I had a very quiet but um, serious concentration about work that was supposed to be done in school. And he allowed us how he guessed he wouldn't do it. And I said, you know, it's immaterial to me, Leroy, whether you do it now or you do it at 4.30 this afternoon. <laughs> So the choice is yours. And he looked at me and I looked at him and he picked up his pencil and the work got done. And we never had any more trouble, except he would pick me up. <laughs> and afterward, when I was no longer teaching, he would run into my husband and he'd say, hey, Mr. Rice, how's your old lady? <laughs> and the old lady was probably 24 years old. <laughs> but you know, to this day, he's huge now. If I go into Mrs. Murphy's, and Leroy's there, and he's usually more there than not. He always buys me a cup of coffee and a donut if I desire it. And we sit there and we talk. Yeah. And we got laughing because one morning, back then we took milk money. First thing in the morning, we took milk money and we checked off names. And he showed up at my desk, handed me his money, smiled at me, and put a mouse on my arm, <laughs> on my sleeve. Well, unbeknownst to him, I am not afraid of mice. I think they're kind of cute, the little country mice. Now, if he put a snake there, I'd have been over the Canadian border <laughs> saying Jack Spratt, but it was a mouse. And I looked at it, and I looked at him, and I said, oh, isn't that cute? How did you know I always wanted a mouse of my own? <laughs> he said, you do? <laughs> I said, yes, it is so nice of you. And he looked at me and said, it's not your mouse, it's my mouse. <laughs> I said, you mean to say that isn't my mouse? No. Well, I said, I am bitterly disappointed. And if it isn't my mouse, you put it back wherever you, whatever you had it in, and you take it home, and I don't want to see it here again, because if I do, it is my mouse. You'll never get it back. You got me? <laughs> You've never seen such a disappointed kid in your life. <laughs> it took the wind right out of the sails completely. <laughs> And from then on, life was very tranquil. No more problems. He, was, he basically was a very good kid. And I was lucky to have such good kids. And I'm going to end with a story that I was not going to talk about, but my brother in Florida was talking with me on the phone this morning, and I told him this story, and he said, oh my God, you've got to tell that one. That's hilarious. I had been the director of the Mark Skinner Library about two years when Oscar, V. Johnson Jr., and he was president of the Board of Trustees, and my good friend, and a handsome, handsome man, asked me if I would be willing to be guest speaker for the Lions Club, big get-together that they had once a year up at the Marble Edge where they came from all corners of the state, and the high potentate came down and handed out awards. I said, will I get to eat? Yes. <laughs> okay, I'll do it, I said. What do you want me to talk about? Well, the library. So I sat down and I wrote a brief history and where I wanted to see the library go, what I wanted to try to accomplish with that library in the time that I was there. And I verbalized it to him, good, he said. So comes the night, he shows up in his Lincoln Continental, all dressed to the nines with that pure white hair and he was pretty spiffy. 
And I was, you know, I wore my usual rags, <laughs> dressed them up a little bit, but I was ready to go, and off we went. Well, we got up there, and I was sitting at the head table. I had no idea that there were going to be at least 100 men come. I was the only woman in that room, and I was surrounded by all these men looking at me. So I smiled. And the guest from Montpelier or wherever was sitting down the line at the head table, and when he was introduced, he told a joke. Now, I like jokes, you know that, but I don't like filth. He told the most terrible, awful, dreadful joke. And all these men are looking at me, you know, to see if I go, oh, tuh, 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 tuh. so I just kept a totally blank face like I didn't hear it. But I really was dying to get up and say, well, now that was very interesting, but let me tell you about, you know, but I didn't. So come time I stood up and I gave my speech, and I ended by saying, I have some cards here that I'd be happy to sell you so that you can have a membership to the library. Ten dollars a piece. I mean, talk about cheap. I sold 20 cards. But I think they expected me to stand up and go, blue, 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 and I didn't because I don't mind speaking to people at all. And if it's 100 men, it's 100 men. Who cares? So they gave me a standing ovation. The evening ended, ended well. And Oscar said, well, it's only 9.30, and we're all pumped up and dressed up. It's too bad to have to go home. What do we do? I said, we'll go to the taco house. I've never been there, and I'm dying to go in there. <laughs> really? I said, have you ever been there? Well, let's go. So he parked his Lincoln Continental next to the building, and we went into the taco house. And the bartender happened to be a young woman that used the library quite frequently. And when we went in all talked up and me and my heels, her jaw dropped to her chest and she said, Mrs. Rice, what are you doing here? I said, I've come to give a speech on Mark Skinner Library, so everybody listen up. And some of the people couldn't, some of the men, it was mostly men, but I was used to it by that time. <laughs> so up rose Crunch Carangio, another character whom I've known since eighth grade. He was the trash hauler. And he hugged us both and he said, I'm buying the drink. I said, you're on. So I had a very modest sombrero, because that's more like a, you know, a milk drink. And I don't know what Oscar had, but it was a lot more powerful than mine. And we sat there, we chatted, and we talked, and we laughed. And it was about 11 o'clock when we decided maybe Oscar better take me home and go home to Cecilia. So he let me out, and I went in, and Carl said, for crying out loud, did that meeting last this long? I said, oh, no through at 9.30. Well, where have you been? I said, Taco House. What? <laughs> I said, well, Oscar and I wanted a drink, so we went to the Taco House. And I said, I was very disappointed there was no fight while I was there, because I was really hoping to see some pushing and shoving, and there wasn't any. I'll be darned, he said, and he started to laugh. The next morning, Oscar called me at the library. He was laughing. He said, I got a tip. He said, by the time I got home, it was almost 12. And Seal was in bed, so I thought, I'm not going to wake her up, I'm going to go to bed. So he went to bed, went to sleep. He said the next morning, covers are being shaken, and he opened his eyes, and there stood Cecile in her nightgown with her hands on her hips. And she said, would you mind telling me what the hell you were doing at the taco house last night with Dale Rice? <laughs> it was probably 8 o'clock in the morning. Somebody had called Linda and told Linda, and of course Linda called her mother, and <laughs> <laughs> oh, we laughed. I said, small town. Small town. But it was a delightful town, and it still is, but in a very different way. And I, what pleases me are, in the summer, the flowers, the painted buildings, and in winter, particularly the holidays, all the holiday decorations and the trees. That's lovely. I'm not so fond of some of the other stuff, but <laughs> I came here in 58. We went to Bennington for a couple of years. We built a house west of Bennington in the country for five years. Then we came back and bought the house on Cemetery Road that Kathleen James owns now. And uh, we were there 18 years. Our children grew up there. And when they went away, and we're thankfully coming back home to live with us, we sold and built a house in Sunderland where we were for 25 years. But on his death seven years ago, I moved back to Manchester. I'm staying. At, I have a condo at Manchester East, which is 
very lovely. So I'm back. It's been a big circle. And I'm back, and the town has changed remarkably. But in a lot of ways, it, it's progressed remarkably, too. So it's just a question of adjustment. But this is a lovely place to live. It really is. I liked it a little better when it was a little more cozy. But hey, every once in a while, at Shaw's, I run into somebody who gives me a hug. And I'm still running into students that I had in the fourth grade many, many moons ago who will come up and and surprisingly, it's more the men than it is the women. I was in Bank of Bennington looking for you because I had a good joke for you. And uh, one of them tapped me on the shoulder and I turned around this big hairy guy with the beard. It was one of the Marrows from Mount Tabor. Oh, oh sure. Oh, yeah. 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 Big yeah. hug. Ricky. Ricky. Yeah. 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 Hello. I haven't seen him since 1963. Yeah. Yeah. So we had a good time. Anyway, we're running out of time, and I'm glad you came, and I hope I didn't bore you too much. It's good to see you all, because I see so many familiar faces, and it's really nice to see you. Thank you.